So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andreas Ferber. I will talk about a proposed socket API, or actually several ones, um, for the LoRa wireless technology. First, let me start with a few words about myself. Um, I work at SUSE as a project manager responsible for the ARM architecture. Um, I have been involved for many more years in the OpenSUSE ARM port, um, and uh, more recently I have also become kernel maintainer for some of the more niche um, ARM socks, such as Realtek and uh, Action Semiconductor. Um, I'm listing a number of other things that I've also done in the past, but I will simply skip over that. Um, this talk um, will specifically focus on software interfaces for this particular technology. I will not go into the exact details of how physically the modulation and everything is going to work. Um, everything and more that you ever wanted to know about this, you will probably find in this talk and some that have been referenced before. Um, from uh, FOSDEM, which is also going to go into a bit um, reverse engineering of how the things actually work that you normally don't see, except if you have SDR hardware. LoRa appears to be short for long range. This is one of the low power, wide area network technologies that uh, um, have been, um, that are being hyped in the IoT world. Um, this means in particular that you have um, a uh, range um, in the, say, tens of kilometers or two-digit kilometers, um, but you are sacrificing that with a low data rate. So this is mainly used for transmitting sensor data to some form of gateway or some other listening device um, and is not, for example, being used the same way as Wi-Fi for having arbitrary network um, traffic over that interface. It is... Um, um, mainly today being used in the unlicensed sub-gigahertz um, short-range devices here in Europe or internationally the um, industrial scientific medical bands. Um, but more recently it is also available in the 2.4 gigahertz ISM band um, that, you know, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth and all those other technologies have been using traditionally. Um, what is interesting about LoRa technology is that uh, you are not per se dependent on a particular network provider that would be um, for payment of uh, fees um, giving you a um, gateway that you can actually connect to, um, but rather you can set up both the um, sending device and the receiving device on your own if you want. Um, not strictly necessary, but um, it's possible. And uh, most importantly, um, the um, hardware modules and devices are available in great abundance and are fairly cheap, so a couple of dollars um, for particular models. Um, there is a lengthy list that I've compiled as a part of going through um, writing drivers and evaluating drivers for this particular project. And uh, most ultimately, um, why would anyone do it? Well, it's simply possible to do it. So let's uh, simply give that a try. When I, uh, um, through some crowd, sorry, when I first received through some crowd crowdfunding campaign a bag of components, um, that was literally my first start with, uh, with this technology. So it was like a half-assembled uh, PCB, and uh, that basically raises the question, You've got the chip, the technology, you have a basic understanding of how it works, but how do you actually make it work with the Linux system? And uh, from there on, I'm going to dive into um, how to deal with this um, in the, from the software side. So um, first of all, a look at what hardware is available. So there's um, different types um, of radio modules available. So um, Usually you don't get the actual transceiver chip itself, but you get some module that already has some um, clocks, amplifiers, um, radio connectors on them. And um, the one that I started with was simply um, a module that would expose exactly the chipset interface that uh, the vendor um, had created for this. Um, interfaces that this um, would be using mainly SPI, but it could also be and in some other cases, UART or uh, USB interfaces. Um, these uh, 
chips that I will go into more detail later on um, do not have any permanent storage of any address data or um, identifiers that would be used in the communication. So this data always needs to be supplied by Linux in order to be able to do any meaningful networking. Um, similarly, um, this trans these transceivers um, provide the physical layer of the network communication and in order to have any particular framing and routing and um, in particular LoRaWAN um, data communication, then this needs to be implemented in software. So if we're using it in a Linux system, that needs to be somewhere implemented in Linux itself. Then um, there is a growing number of uh, modules that do not directly expose um, this raw interface from the vendor, but rather come up with their own interface. Um, to some degree, that is obviously taking care of uh, some of the, um, let's just say, interrupt handling and other interaction between, in particular, the, the receive path and buffering, um, but also um, the main point why people are doing it because this allows um, the vendors to certify a particular firmware stack that they deliver on this module um, that then passes certifications from the LoRa Alliance to be compliant with um, the protocol. And depending on how exactly the firmware interface gets implemented per vendor, that also determines which of the actual chipset features will be available to the user in the end. And finally, um, this can be a trap at some times. Um, there are also modules that do not actually expose a particular interface that could be consumed by Linux, but are rather intended for doing your own microcontroller development directly um, close to the lower chip, um, where then you would need to use a particular vendor um, API um, in order to uh, make use of the radio functionality with or without a Mac on board. So I'm now going to go a bit more into Linux kernel interfaces, how that looks like today. So uh, um, up here, I've barely sketched that there are you know, some generic kernel subsystems that I assume most of you will know anyway, maybe even better than myself. And uh, down here, um, for example, I've sketched the SPI subsystem. And there, in particular, the SPIDEV module would be used in order to um, expose a generic um, interface to a SPI device that has been attached. Um, alternatively, if there's a UART uh, interface being exposed, then you would have, um, depending on what uh, host system you're working with, a whole range of various TTY devices up here. Or if it's, uh, you know, like a USB stick that you're attaching to your notebook or um, a MPCI card, uh, MPCIE, sorry, um, then you would have, you know, some of those um, USB drivers down here being used. and Ultimately, they will simply, in the file system, be exposing some device, you know, here, dev, spy 0.0, .0 or depending on how many you have and how many chip selects, the number obviously will differ. But uh, you will have some device, and the API to use those devices then is the traditional, you know, read and write calls, or in particular, uh, when it's spy, then probably rather ioctals to have, um, you know, both read and write in one call without talking the chip select line. And uh, that is basically it. So um, given that, there's a number of issues with that. So um, it appears that uh, most of the vendors have their own forks of certain packages. Um, but there is no central um, package that we could simply take and include it in our OpenSUSE or slash products in order to run um, this kind of software because there's hard-coded constants like an if def, are you like in the European region, are you in the US or somewhere in Asia in order to define various frequency bands and settings. Um, then another issue I've run into is that um, many um, of such um, more hobbyist um, projects that you can find on GitHub um, are actually consuming GPL libraries that are incompatible with the library of the LoRa stack that they're using, which is then something that we would not be able to redistribute. And um, in particular, the uh, SpyDev module that we saw on the previous slide um, does not react favorably to when being used with a DT-compatible string of literally SpyDev, but uh, um, the... Uh, um, 
Spy maintainers have explicitly said that uh, they expect SpyDev only to be used in certain cases when it is not feasible to have a kernel driver. And as such, um, when you actually use this string SpyDev in your device tree, you will end up with um, a warning uh, message with a stack trace in your uh, kernel log, which obviously may serve to um, at least confuse um, people uh, or get people into a panic mode when they see that. So what has been recommended, um, because well, if you're, um, if you're developing your own kernel and compiling everything on your own, then you can much easily in uh, say the spider driver, you know, add a single line to define an additional um, compatible string for your particular use case. But if you're like Zuse, someone that provides a distro to other people, then uh, that is not possible for the end users and we don't want to have a downstream list of devices that would be using this particular driver. So um, one way to work around that is to simply um, hijack a defined um, compatible string for a device. That is something that actually the spy maintainers have been suggesting. That is of course also um, contrary to the concept of device tree descriptions. Um, and finally, um, when you're using a um, generic SpyDiv layer and device to access in your applications, um, then you don't necessarily know which device you are actually talking to. So that means that in many cases you will have some code in user space that is trying to probe which device is actually connected to Spy by like reading certain registers and just trying to have some heuristics of um, detecting is it one lower chip or another um, and then making decisions, for example, for um, is the reset low active or high active? One of the funny differences there between some. Um, and ultimately, therefore, um, I've come up with the idea of uh, simply moving the um, drivers for lower chips into the kernel um, and to thereby um, allow, I get into that later on, um, to write generic packet forwarding applications um, that do not depend on which particular library um, or device they are being used with um, and hopefully create a community that those can be centrally maintained and then packaged and don't have to be duplicated all the time for each network provider. Now, um, thinking about you have the uh, spy driver in the kernel and you have your um, user space somewhere down here, um, how should they actually talk to each other and what are the requirements um, that you have? Um, you will want to expose basically all features that the chipset provides technically to your users because if you don't do that, if you provide only a very small fraction of those, then people will not adopt the new interface and simply will have to um, go with the old route for making use of them. Um, there are um, multiple proprietary protocols and well, anyone can pretty much um, develop their own proprietary protocol. Um, um, so one design goal here would be to allow people to use that because otherwise if they can't do it with that interface, uh, they will have to find other ways to do that. So basically that um, translates to um, having the um, syscall um, exception in all headers that are related to um, the implementation here. And um, the, I, the basic, um, well, the big goal here would be to be able to reuse protocols. So you don't want to have a, um, again, that this, uh, this idea of code reuse, that you don't want to have an implementation per um, vendor chipset and protocol, but rather that you want to have one implementation of, for example, LoRaWAN or any other protocol maybe simply reuse 802.15.4, something else on top, um, six low pan, something, and just layer that on top of a generic um, network file layer um, and not uh, duplicate that all the time. Um, yes, and obviously it should work with all or at least most of the chips that are out there. And uh, the idea um, that seemed most appealing to me at the time was to use sockets because that is, well, what we all know from networking in particular if we've done that with Ethernet um, or Wi-Fi and so on. Um, and hopefully that will make it easier for people to adopt such a new technology.
Now, this is my very first uh, journey into network subsystems, so um, there has been a lot of new things for me. Um, what I've been um, implementing and sending out an RFC to the NetF mailing list has been in the net subsystem to have a LoRa module that uh, um, is implementing those basic sockets and then in um, the more concrete device subsystems, um, driver subsystems, in particular in SPY, have um, a number of uh, drivers um, corresponding to the uh, um, chipsets, as well as in the serial device um, subsystem for um, any other devices that are using a UART serial-based um, protocol. Ultimately, that will then mean that uh, if you look at IPA, or the file system in this case, you will have network devices that get instantiated by the drivers. And uh, I've simply chosen for now to just call them LoRa with a running number. So um, assume here there's a 1276 driver would be exposing one um, LoRa Zero device here, and then another driver would be exposing a further device, and so on. Now, what's um, different from the previous model of uh, working with uh, IOCTLs and read-write is that uh, um, through the socket API, we can instantiate such a socket construct or even multiple of them. Um, we can then bind the sockets to a particular socket address and then um, send and receive via those sockets. And we will be using socket buffers to represent um, an individual um, packet that has been um, received or is to be received via this interface. Now, um, looking at the particular um, chipsets in order to figure out how to structure those things, um, the SX1272 um, and uh, SX1276 following um, are signal channel um, devices. They um, support two selectable modes, one FSK OOK and the other one, the LoRa one, that I'll concentrate on for now. I'll be getting back to that later. Um, those modes can be switched via a special sleep state, which means basically that it loses all data that was previously configured um, if you want to switch between them. Similarly, it is using a state machine for switching between receiving and, trans um, and transmitting. Um, this has to go through an intermediate standby state, um, but it means similar with the uh, single stand sorry with the single channel statement above that it is a half duplex interface, so you can only do one at a time always. And. Uh, for receiving a LoRa mode, it has 256 bytes, up to 256 bytes of data buffer available for FSK64. Um, there are ways using interrupts, I've been told, to enlarge that up to, I think, 2048, but it gives you a rough idea of how much data we're actually dealing with here at the moment. Similarly, there is a new generation, um, SX126X. Uh, I have one here, so this is an Arduino shield with this chipset on it. Um, ideally, this is basically the, the radio logic on there. The rest is just for um, bringing it out to the Arduino pins. Um, similarly, different modes available. Um, a state machine to define what you're actually doing at the moment, and you always have to go through some um, intermediate state. Um, in this case, there's uh, not just a spy uh, register interface available, but a spy command interface um, that in turn can be used with a read register, write register command in order to access um, registers on the device. Um, data buffer in a similar magnitude. And uh, also this is um, slightly, uh, well, this is um, quite similar to the one that uh, we've just uh, taken a look at. The difference here is that this one is actually using the 2.4 gigahertz band, and as such has um, 
slightly different uh, modes that it is um, supporting, but otherwise um, from the registry interface and so on is still quite similar to the other one. What is much different is the SX13OX family. So these are referred to as concentrators and basically what you can um, understand them for is they are one of those um, SX12 whatever chips cut in half and um, you can now have two separate radio chips, SX12, 55, um, 56, uh, sorry, 55, 57, 58, um, that you um, simply have the first part of um, those transceivers that simply output um, the data that they received um, on I and Q lines, and you will then on these um, 13 OX chips have an ADC that is um, getting that data in there and has some um, packet processing logic in order to emulate um, 49 channels out of two transceivers that it actually talks to. And this one again, much like the original um, SX1276, has a register interface. Um, however, in this case, it is unfortunately not very, or no longer, I hear, very well documented and uh, there is um, reference code available on GitHub how um, Zemtech have um, implemented the user space um, interface themselves. Um, data buffer, slightly larger, but um, is also dealing with the data of um, 10 channels in one buffer. And uh, one thing of note here regarding the driver implementation is um, unlike the other um, chipsets, this one is dealing with binary firmware that it needs to load into the chipset in order to, um, for one, calibrate and then afterwards operate. Um, however, they are under a BSD license, so are at least not a problem to uh, redistribute. So much for the actual Zemtech chipsets. Um, then, based on those chipsets, I already mentioned there are um, a number of modules that are implementing via some microcontroller or a um, UART serial interface of their own. Um, the um, serial device bus that we briefly saw in the image earlier on allows to attach an in-kernel driver to a TTY device. It will then not be accessible to user space. This is available for, I think, since 4.12. Um, and um, the way that you would feed that information to that um, bus infrastructure is by having an additional child node in the device tree be below the actual UART um, device node in the device tree. Um, so that provides a callback for receiving data depending on how um, that particular chipset um, you're dealing with is operating. You might receive individual characters be transmitted via that callback and need to individually buffer those into a um, sensible format that you can then process, um, or it might be sending you like a whole chunk. Unfortunately, you don't really um, can't control that, so basically you need to do some buffering on your own. And obviously there are APIs available in the Zoda framework to also send data back in order to um, communicate with that device. Now, while everyone writes about AT command interfaces, I have found that in practice they can't even agree on what line ending they use. Um, they differ on whether they are case sensitive, case insensitive, and if they're case sensitive, whether they want to be lowercase or uppercase. So basically I have, um, although I've dealt with well, probably a handful um, of them by now, um, not come up with a standard interface that I could get them into one form, but if rather needed to um, have one driver per um, interface protocol that was being implemented. In some cases, it is not a textual AT command, um, protocol, but rather some random binary command where you then have like some command code that you're sending, if you're lucky, also like a length value that you can deal with unknown commands, and you will need to then, you know, possibly deal also with checksums on those uh, binary commands. Um, and ultimately, there's two ways that the communication can work as far as reception goes. One is that you have external GPIO lines that will signal you as kind of an interrupt, 
um, whether um, data is now available in the buffer or whether, what the state of the buffer is. Um, or um, you could have in your um, textual AT command interface maybe some asynchronous notification that um, even without sending something to the interface, you may be getting some notification via the callback that um, an event has occurred that then needs to be processed. USB, unfortunately, has been a slightly bigger problem so far. Um, one of them, so in, in theory, you could just uh, take a um, USB serial driver and attach um, Zodiff, well, a Zodiff bus and Zodiff devices to that bus. Um, however, um, today, USB serial devices uh, don't appear to have an actual device tree node attached to them. So um, there was a proposal to fix that. There was still some discussion and uh, difference of opinion for how to exactly to go about that. Um, connected to that same problem is uh, in your device tree, how would you actually um, tell that you have a particular um, device connected to USB? So um, one was to have a special, I think, serial node under the device bus that would then get simply um, um, numbered. Um, another one is what you may know from, for example, the Raspberry Pi is using um, the USB vendor ID, comma, product ID um, schema in order to pass through, like, for example, the MAC address from firmware into the kernel driver. Obviously, for that, you need to know on which part of, you know, the various USB hubs and controllers is the device actually connected. Um, with ACPI, um, it becomes slightly more difficult, and I have to say that that is not my field of expertise. Um, I did at some point find a command line option to overload ACPI tables from, for example, your, your RAM disk that would allow you to add information to the ACPI tables describing such options because obviously if you're running you know, a notebook, you don't want to flash your notebook firmware with custom modifications in order to make such a device undetected if it's not you know, a ready-made product coming to you. Also, um, similarly, still connected to that, if you have USB ports, well, you usually don't just have one. What happens if you plug the device into a different USB port than before? Would it still be found that way? Or would that be hard-coded to a particular um, position, maybe also connected to how the exact USB hub um, topology looks like internally to the controllers and devices? One idea was to simply use USB drivers and um, try to detect that um, a particular device as you enumerate it, and you know you can see the data in LSUSB and so on, um, if it on doesn't only have a particular interface but a particular combination of vendor ID and product ID, simply try to have a driver loaded with higher priority that would then attach to that device and somehow um, reuse the code that is already there for the generic USB devices. Um, an alternative would have been to use a line discipline, so that means you simply um, leave the TTY device and the USB drivers all alone and simply use a user space tool to tell the, the TTY device to switch to a different processing mode. Unfortunately, today we don't seem to have any form of bridge that would make the Zoda framework um, work together with these uh, line discipline callbacks. So basically that would mean that you would have multiple different implementations depending on how you would actually connect the same chipset, which obviously is uh, not ideal. If anyone has any ideas on that, I'd be very um, welcome to hear your feedback on that at the end. Um, for now, um, another challenge um, we're facing here is since we are talking about the physical layer, or, well, data link, uh, um, we are um, talking about packets that come with some preamble to signal the start and also the, the end of the packet, but there is no particular metadata that is just driving it, so there is no addressing or anything going on. Um, also, because there is no addressing, it always gets sent to like all devices that can receive it and then the receiver needs to decide whether it is for them or not because that is uh, on the Mac layer only. Um, the only way to filter at this physical layer is by so-called sync words, which is a sequence of one or more bytes. 
that um, basically gives you a very limited addressing mode um, to distinguish various packets. Um, and uh, therefore, my idea here was to use the relevant radio properties that determine whether you can actually receive a given packet as the address that you are sending or receiving from. Um, and let's take a look how that would look like. So for one, um, because there's no particular addressing, you can't do any automatic routing of packages. That means we need to explicitly say, okay, we want to use the LoRa0 or the LoRa1 interface to send or receive our data respectively. Um, then there's the frequency that we're sending at or receiving at, um, a so-called spreading factor that determines the exact shape of the um, radio signal. Um, then the so-called bandwidth and the mentioned sync word, in the case of LoRa, that is uh, one byte. Um, I don't pretend that this list is entirely complete, um, but something like that would be the idea to use as a socket address specific to LoRa. And uh, with that said, this is how the basic idea looks like. So you'd have on the, uh, the, the phi driver that we were talking about here on the very bottom, you would have um, a LoRa protocol family using the datagram format of sending data, um, and you could then have the user you instantiate that uh, socket device and from user space define what content you are actually going to um, send via that interface. And corresponding to this LoRa socket family, you would then also have a netlink module which allows you via different sockets to configure, um, well, um, the, um, the file layer down here. And similarly, um, there has been work ongoing by Zhang Hong Pang um, to define a LoRaWAN protocol family. Um, similarly, there's uh, two different modes. So there's alternatively the datagram mode as unreliable transmission as they call it, and then the reliable mode, which would be a sequenced packet. Um, and corresponding to that also, we would need some way via NetLink to configure and interact with the uh, LoRaWAN layer below that. And there's two ways to go about that. One would be if we're using you know, such a module with an MCU on it, um, then we could simply reuse that hard Mac, um, if available and implemented by the vendor, or um, if we want to have it all in Linux, then we would need a module that translates the LoRaWAN packets down into the LoRa format, adding any needed um, header information. By extension, since I already showed LoRaWAN without going into much detail what exactly that is, so basically that is a framing protocol that has addressing modes, it has um, joining operations for um, exchanging credentials with uh, gateways, um, and then obviously, well, sending, receiving in those two different modes. Um, and it defines a set of so-called data rates. Those data rates are like a, a meta description of all the various channel protocols that I was showing for the LoRa layer below. So um, it actually supports two different modes. If we're looking at the LoRa mode here first, then that would obviously be the frequency again, the spreading factor and the bandwidth um, that is being defined as a particular data rate. I think it's like zero to 15-ish, something like that. Um, and some of those data rates are actually using the FSK mode and also then have a frequency associated with that and a bandwidth. So the spreading factor is something that's specific to LoRa here. Um, similar to, um, you know, um, TCP IP, there's also the concept of different ports that you can have. Um, and um, since at least currently uh, we are bound to um, a specific network interface on the LoRa layer, this is also what we may need to use on the LoRa 1 layer. And depending on what data rate or I think it's not even, well, there, there is a specification for regional parameters of the LoRaWAN protocol, and at least in that document, 
um, there is associated with the various geographical regions a definition of which sync word to use um, along uh, with that. This I mainly already mentioned on the graphical slide, so we're using the, um, ge the generic link layer, uh, sorry, the generic netlink um, layer to send um, the commands in an extensible way. Um, what I have implemented so far is um, access to the frequency um, in the case. Um, this um, interface that we are designing here needs to work for all um, chipsets and modules that uh, um, are out there. Um, one such thing is that um, initially we've been dealing with single channel um, chipsets. Um, when dealing with the SX13OX, then we have to deal with multiple channels. So it may be necessary to add an attribute which generic netlink allows to be able to specify the channel that we want to operate on because simply it does not have separate uh, receive and send buffers per um, channel, but rather um, a single one for all of them. So it seems to make most sense to um, have only one network device, even if there's multiple channels in it. Currently, the Netlink implementation in um, my staging tree um, is making assumptions that all the LoRa interfaces have actually been created through my uh, LoRa dev module with um, certain um, settings set there and data structures available. Obviously, that is not something that we can merge as is in case someone wants to use some SDR chipset in order to synthesize the signals uh, through different ways without going through those um, same chipsets. Um, and um, um, then there's also the question, of course, we can implement all kinds of configuration interfaces by network layer, but which ones should we actually implement? So there are certain properties that are actually hardware properties, like if you have a, uh, an antenna with um, a center frequency of 868 megahertz, then it may make sense to provide that information via the um, device tree layer along as the hardware description, um, whereas um, you know, the exact frequency that you're going to use, um, from my perspective, certainly makes sense to make configurable via the Netlink layer so that the user can easily um, set that, or well, as we've seen before, possibly even as part of the socket address. Then on LoRa 1, it's basically the same, just um, with different operations on it. Um, you have, um, for one, the data rate that I already explained in some more detail um, that should be able to um, read and set. Um, there may be operations such as join that we could implement via Netlink and use that in order to bring a, a network device up in a particular um, usable configuration. Um, and um, Depending on what device you're actually dealing with, this could be delegated to the existing um, NLORA module um, for um, using the LoRa layer um, configuration of frequency, bandwidth, and so on and so on. Or um, if there is a particular command to have that operation um, performed directly, then it could also go directly there. Another topic here is that, uh, in particular, when we're thinking about the sub-gigahertz channels, which is what LoRa, in particular, as widely deployed in Europe, is being used for, um, then there is currently, not to my knowledge, any database that would contain um, the regulatory information of what is allowed in which country or region. Um, in particular, um, that means we have a 14 dBm um, transmit power limitation here in Europe. Um, in the US, you can go, I think, up to 20 or more. Um, there's also a duty cycle limit that you are only supposed to use up to 0.1%, whatever, of the available um, time on that frequency. And, uh, well, there are ways to, to circumvent that, but at least there is no database that would be exactly spelling that out in machine-readable form in order to automatically feed that into the configuration interfaces that I was just talking about. So, um, the idea here would be to um, 
find some way to reuse existing technologies such as uh, wireless RecDB or CRDA maybe. I'm not so much into the details there yet. Um, in particular, since the uh, 2.4 gigahertz uh, modules could then be able to reuse the data that already exists from Wi-Fi and other technologies um, for the 2.4 gigahertz um, frequency bands. And uh, yeah, if we have the data available of uh, what can be set, and if we have interfaces available for actually setting those configuration bits, then um, it should be possible for user space to simply feed that um, into those interfaces. Currently, um, what has been implemented for um, many or, well, some of the um, drivers that exist today um, is the, uh, the transmission path for packets um, because that is fairly easy to do given the um, state machine and model that I was describing. Um, however, there does not appear to be a way to proactively or not direct way to proactively receive packets only when you want to. So that would mean that once you bring up a network interface, you would need to start listening on that interface so that once a network um, packet comes in, you can then notify any um, available listeners, if any, and only interrupt the listening for new packets if you actually want to send out packages yourself. Um, with um, transmitting, that is fairly easy as you only have to make sure that only one person is accessing the registry interface at a time, otherwise you would um, simply um, be able to use locks to rule out that two people are doing that at the same time. Um, however, what happens if one person wants to listen um, on one channel and the other person on another channel? Or if one person wants to listen for uh, LoRa messages and another person wants to listen for FSK messages. Um, so basically we would need a way to detect whether the current configuration of listeners is actually possible and if so, find some way to um, error out on those that are um, incompatible with what is already going on. Another note here also is um, on Ethernet. Um, you have a well-defined frame format with this, I think it's called EtherID, where you have a field that indicates a protocol number that you can then use to, um, um, to parse the packets and uh, tra transmit them to a particular um, layer. Um, this is not possible here, so that means in order to detect a LoRa 1 packet, one would actually need to try to parse all incoming LoRa packets and try to convert them to the LoRa format. This is um, how it looks like with some of the um, some of the other surrounding protocols in context. So there are some proprietary protocols shown here. Um, if we're looking at the FSK, then there are some existing um, stuff like uh, 802.15.4 that could be reused. Um, BLE in some cases is also based on FSK um, and then the various other protocol formats here. Yep. So, uh, um, yes, yeah, some of those protocols are also available on non-LoRa modules, so that is a potential naming problem that we need to go to. Um, there is a generic protocol family for packets that could, in theory, be used to transmit LoRa packets. However, um, that would um, take away the um, duality of different frequencies and um, settings that could be selected, so that is not really an ultimate selection, only if we want to go through Netlink for everything. Um, I will skip over that and uh, just say a few words that I have an um, interop set up for some of those drivers um, for the European um, technologies where various uh, modules have been provided that are being used on various single board computers. Um, there are some hints for how you can go testing um, yourself. And uh, yes, I'm working towards a V2 patch set with what has been um, shown here today. Um, implemented that will be sent out hopefully fairly shortly um, with the goal of stabilizing the ABI and then starting to get that merged. This is some of the vendors that have contributed. In particular, Ben here from Laird has been doing some great contributions for the SX-1300X and a whole number of vendors have been contributing hardware to develop these interfaces. So 
there is a number of companies that are interested, and uh, there's also some competing technologies that are already shown, like Zigfox and NBIoT, that may also need some interfaces where they are um, on the same module. And uh, yes, USB is an issue that we need to solve. And uh, since the time is running out, please come to me after the talk, find me somewhere or contact me by email if you're interested in a the topic. There is unfortunately no um, dedicated mailing list for this yet. If anyone can help get that set up, then please also get in touch with me. Um, otherwise, um, just email me or um, reach out on the NetDev mailing list. No time for questions, so thank you very much for your attention and uh, enjoy the next talk.